Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this live online question and answer session on the proposed new tax reforms. This is a bit of a technical first for us. We haven't used this format before, but in many ways, it's just an extension of the, the roadshow we've been doing with drop-in sessions around the island. We want to give as many people in the island as or in fact the bailiwick, the chance to ask questions to those behind the tax proposals and to get answers and to make sure that everybody understands what's being put forward. We're due to be here for about an hour. We're going to deal with as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, you're, I'm told that the only way to actually ask questions this evening, we were hoping that you'd be able to do it by email as well, but is through the Facebook Live facility. And I think details of that will come up on your screen at, uh, shortly. But just bear in mind, it is only the Facebook group that you'll be able to use. Just a plea, try to keep the language that you use appropriate for all viewers. I'm sure that you'll do that. <laughs> but you know, we are going to moderate it just in case anybody thinks that it's not a good idea to use civil language. Um, so without any further ado, I'll introduce the panel here. My name is Peter Roffey. I'm the president of the Social Security, Employment and Social Security Committee. On my left, I've got the Treasury lead for PNR, which is Deputy Mark Hellier, and at the end, the Treasurer, uh, Beth Ann Haynes. On my right, I'm sure you all recognize the president of PNR, uh, Deputy Stroke Advocate, Peter Fairbrush. And at the end, we have uh, a member of both ESS and the uh, Tax Review Working Party, uh, Mark Thompson. So as I say, we will try to get as many questions in as we can, try to get them in early so that we know how many we have to deal with, and if we're going, we know we're up facing a lot of them, then we'll try to get through them quickly. The first question comes from Paul, and predictably it's on GST. Paul wants to know when GST will come in, uh, and at how much, he says against an income tax rise of 2%, so I presume he means how much would a GST raise in comparison with just putting 2% uh, mm -hmm. on our current system of income tax. So I'll, I'll turn to the Treasury lead first, uh, Deputy Hellier. Good evening. Thanks, Paul, for your question. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a good one, actually, because it deals with a number of different issues. The, fir the first thing which I think um, we've not really been able to get over is that we're not talking about if we were, if the state's members were to approve GST, about it being uh, imposed effectively immediately. It will take some time for businesses to adjust their, their own accounting, uh, and we estimate, as it was in Jersey, that it would take up to two years for, for uh, not only the states to gear themselves up, for businesses as well. So given that today we've announced that there's going to likely be a delay in the policy letter towards the end of the year, it's unlikely that we would see a GST being imposed before the end of 2025 or, or about that time. Um, in terms of your question about how much GST raises, our calculations, and they're very much based on experience in, in Jersey, 1% of GST raises about £11 million, um, and 1% of income tax raises about £13 million. So 2% of income tax, as you asked in your question, would be £26 million. Um, the, the point I would make is that very, far fewer people pay income tax than would pay GST. GST is spread across the whole population, including people visiting the island and including those who live here at the moment but actually have no income. They live off capital. Okay. Do you want to add anything to that, uh, Madam Treasurer? No, thank you. No. Okay. No, that's fine. <laughs> in which case, we will move on to the next question, which comes from Oliver. Uh, oh, I think this is potentially quite controversial. Um, an elderly bashing, it might be, but saying with the population shifting to more elderly, should the tax structure be made less attractive to people retiring? So should we sort of, I guess means, be sort of encouraged to stay and work for longer, which is obviously one of the aims of uh, of, of the states. But um, Peter, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, I mean, people are will have to uh, work longer. I mean, eventually, by 2047 or whatever it is, income tax age, uh, sorry, retirement age will be raised to 70. It's already 66 or whatever it might be. Now, uh, elderly people, and that includes uh, myself, uh, we do have to pay normal income tax on our income tax, uh, on our earnings, and we don't get any particular allowance uh, a bit beyond anything that uh, is uh, permitted otherwise on that. Where we do benefit, I think, is the social insurance contributions, because we don't make social insurance contributions beyond a certain age. We make payment uh, towards a health scheme and mm -hmm. old age, etc., etc. Uh, that is not insignificant for a lot of people, but if you were going to tinker with it, I think you could just say, if you are earning above a certain figure, you continue to pay social insurance. 
Okay. Any other comments on this one on the panel? Okay. Uh, hopefully that was helpful. We're going to move on to Tony. He wants to talk about uh, corporate tax. And Tony's point is that taxing the corporates and the wealthy is the easy option, but we apparently won't do it uh, because it will impact on us and our friends. I think, Tony, you're making some assumption about my friends, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> or that you've got some. <laughs> well, exactly. Uh, uh, Mark. Yeah, um, could, could we have um, slide five? If possible, please, because Tony, I think this helps um, illustrate something that we've been talking about quite a bit. Um, there, there's no, uh, there's no favouritism in this. Um, it, it, uh, suggesting any kind of tax rises, even for the wealthy, is unpopular. So uh, to suggest that, that we're doing it for our own benefit uh, is incorrect, because under the proposals that were brought last year in the Green Paper, the wealthy would pay more. Uh, than, uh, than uh, those who are less well off. And the, the reason we put up this particular slide is it shows you there are colours across the graph with a sort of uh, a, a sky blue on the right hand side and then lighter blue to white. Each of those boxes, if you like, or rectangles represents 25% of our uh, current tax take. And you'll see that on the extreme right hand side in the uh, 95 to 100% of, of that graph, is 6% uh, of the population is paying 25% of the tax already. So the idea that we don't, and many people don't understand that um, tax allowances for the wealthy disappear once you get to a certain level. Uh, the wealthy effectively have no tax allowances at all, and that's what makes uh, our current uh, regime uh, progressive in nature. Um, what, one of the um, principles behind the, the, the package that's been put forward is also to correct um, inequality at the lower end, Peter, of, mm. the, of the social security spectrum, because social security allowances don't work like income tax allowances. Once you um, pay, once you get paid in your job more than 7,400, I think it is some, somewhere around there, mm. the minute you go a penny over that, you pay social security on everything down to the bottom, whereas in, in uh, income tax allowances, you, get, you keep that allowance uh, until you get to a relatively high rate of earning. I'd say in terms of corporates as well, the proposal do include £10 million of additional corporate tax. And I think the thing which also not been, um, perhaps people don't realise about GST, is that corporates will have to pay it as well. So all the finance services uh, industry will have to pay uh, a form of GST. In Jersey, that's uh, translated for ease of administration into a fixed charge, which they pay. That's right, Bethan, isn't it? So it's, it, this is not a tax which is purely aimed at your shopping. Yeah, everybody will pay it. Every type of business that provides a service will pay it as well. And that includes finance and it includes corporates. Um, Bethan, um, there is further work being done on, on the issue of corporation tax, isn't there, to, to make sure we've got our figures approximately right when we do eventually come back to the States? That's correct. So we have, we have assumed a level of £10 million additional to be raised from corporate tax as part of these proposals, but we've just commissioned a piece of work um, externally to look at all the options for corporate tax and whether we're missing a trick. Um, obviously, it's important that we remain competitive, so that's that's high on the agenda. But whether we can raise any further revenues from corporates um, w will be. We, we should know before the summer um, what the options are there. I also just wanted to mention the the, the um, prop proposals that we've put together for for GST. Deputy Hellier mentioned that um, businesses would have to pay GST, so we reckon that the financial services sector would pay about six million pounds of the GST that we raise under our package. And then I was just going to also mention the um, the option of, of taxing the wealthy, if you like. Um, we did do some analysis to look at. Um, whether we could ha have a higher rate of income tax for those so those wealthier in the in society, um, and so we we looked at what what rate you would need to set to to raise about an additional forty million pounds. Um, so we looked at that, and it came out as everybody who earns over sixty thousand pounds would have to pay a tax at thirty percent. Um, so that that shows that when you're just when you are just trying to limit. Um, you know who you're raising the tax from it can have quite an Im a big impact on a few people what i would say before bringing in um peter who i know wants to add to this is of course it's entirely down to states members when we go back with this discussion if they prefer to raise it on income tax there is some fragility in the fact that you're raising so much just on taxes on income and you've got a very narrow tax base but if that's their preferred option that's fine well i don't think it is fine but i think it's, a, it's certainly an option 
what isn't an option is not to raise extra revenues in any way whatsoever, because we know we won't be able to pay pensions, we won't be able to increase the health care we need for an ageing population, we won't be able to provide the social care. So every responsible states member is going to have to find their preferred way. And if they don't like the way that we propose, I think they have to put an alternative. But Peter, before I move on. Yeah, I can be brief. In relation to the corporate tax point, one of the prime reasons for us uh, deferring the debate uh, today was because we're seeking further information in relation to corporate tax, and that won't be available for one or possibly two months. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question, and in doing so, can I ask for slide four to be put on the, the screen as well? Ne next question is from Lexi, and Lexi says, um, can you increase personal tax allowances so that lower earners are not hit and the increased income and increase income tax or add an upper tier? Well, I think we've been talking about that a little bit. One of the things I'm going to talk about for a second now is that it's not just about income tax. Yes, personal tax allowances can be put up to help people, but will only help people, of course, who are already uh, above the, the tax threshold. The mitigation through Social Security won't be through higher benefits. It's not a benefit culture, we're suggesting. By changing the contribution system, it will really help the, the lower paid in a significant way. And I'm hopeful that you can see that the slide that we're looking at on the monitor here. And we show, actually, if you're on the bottom quarter uh, of the... Uh, earnings levels or, or income levels in Guernsey, uh, you'll actually be paying less overall. So yes, GST may be regressive, but the whole package, including the social security changes, will, will, will mean that you're better off. And then as you're in the next quartile, you are less than 1% worse off. And yes, what, what some people might think is middle currency, then start to be hit in the third quartile up. In other words, uh, between halfway and 75% and up. But we've got to be honest, we're trying to raise £85 million pounds extra here. You can't do it and not hit anybody. But um, uh, So basically, income tax allowances, anything else to add on that from anybody? That was, or have I dealt with that one? Mark, your um, voice in the room. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that we did look at, the th when we looked at three different options last year, we looked at one of them was to raise income tax, and two of them were, or one of them was a, a GST solution, and one of them was a, a bit of a combination. <coughs> and... To, to raise the sort of money that we, we, we need to raise going forward, um, the cost, to, on average, to every household of the income tax package was 1.5% of their, of their income. Um, you know, and, and, but that was very much on a progressive basis. So similar to the slide you've got on the screen there, the people at the lower end of the, of the income distribution would actually be paying less tax and the people at the higher end would be paying more. But on average, an income tax solution was going to actually raise, make people pay on, on average 1.5% more. The GST solutions um, were also going to be progressive in a similar sort of profile to that. But the average uh, payment increasing tax was, um, was only 0.6% for, for a GST solution, which sort of comes back to, to some of the point that I think Mark was making earlier, that it's not just the people on income who have income who would be paying GST, uh, tourists would pay it, companies would pay it, and people who have capital and not income w would pay it as well. So uh, looking at the packages as a whole, as Peter said, you know, we can come up with some quite progressive packages that, that, that blend together a number of measures. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to move on because we're, uh, it's pleasing to see so many questions coming. That, that's not an invitation to dry up. Please keep them coming and we'll deal with them. The next one, I think, rolls almost three political issues of the moment together. Uh, Yvonne on workers saying, we're so short of workers here. Why don't the states buy somewhere like St. Margaret's Lodge? We'll do it somewhere like rather than being site specific tonight, I think. Uh, do it up and house Ukrainians. Once they have jobs, they'll pay taxes so the island will benefit in the long run. So here we have key worker housing, labour shortage, Ukra homes for Ukrainians. That's, that's one for the Chief Minister, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm delighted to try and answer it. We do need more housing. We desperately need more housing. We do need some more people, economically active people. And in relation to Ukrainians, uh, of course, the only, the only system we've got at the moment is those who have family relations. Uh, there have been talk about the other system, home for Ukrainians, uh, but uh, that should be implemented, I would hope, sooner rather than later. It's taking too long, in my view. And that's no criticism of uh, any of the local bodies. That's a UK uh, issue rather than a Guernsey issue. But 
it's too simple to just say build more houses, we'll have more people and we'll get more tax. We've got to deal with the situation as we find it now. Yeah, uh, and of course the population issue will have an impact. We put a presumption, I think a presumption of, of 200 net migration into these proposals. If it's less than that, then we're going to have to raise more money because, as you say, the workers won't be there generating the cash. If, if it turns out more than that, we may have to uh, raise slightly less in the short term. But then, of course, there are the other side of that equation. We'll need to spend more money on housing and infrastructure and things like that. Anybody else want to add to this one? No. In that case, we'll move on to 010. That, 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 um, we need Deputy Trot here to answer this one, really. Um, <laughs> is, this is from Eves. Um, people cannot afford any more rises, so change 010 and tax companies instead. Uh, if they choose to move, well, let them. Okay. Treasury lead. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a fallacy, unfortunately, that corporates don't pay tax. Uh, all of the financial services sector pays uh, pays tax. If we could have slide two, this gives a breakdown of where of where the tax uh, where tax comes from. Um, it, one of the provisions of this review is that we have to maintain a tax status which retains Guernsey's competitiveness from a, an international industry perspective. And I'm not just talking about financial services, I'm talking about people that want to come to the island to live, uh, people who want to invest in the island and so on. Um, all of those things are important. It's important, therefore, to maintain a level playing field with our main competitors. And our main competitor is, is Jersey, just across the water, but also the Isle of Man to some extent. On financial services, we compete on a global basis and with all the offshore centres in the Caribbean and elsewhere. So um, we have to make sure that we, that we don't throw out the, the goose that laid the golden egg, I'm afraid, because the risk of undermining that business in terms of the tax take, and bear in mind that financial services and its allied professional support industries is worth well over 50% of all of our tax. Uh, even a slight reduction in that, encouraged by instability from a political perspective or um, r rash um, attacks on, on the tax base, could have a really, really significant effect on the ability of the states to provide public services. And that, that means everything from the bus service to, um, to being able to be seen in A&E. And, that, and that's, that's the real uh, issue that we're, that we're trying to face up to here. We, we do appreciate that people are under pressure from a tax perspective. And certainly, there's a lot of rising pressure from, from cost of living. And that, I think, is going to continue to grow during the year, not helped at all by the Ukrainian crisis. But we, we have to, as broadly as possible, spread the load across everything. And as I said earlier, corporates and financial services businesses will pay GST. Um, I, I don't disagree that 010 is perceived to be unfair in mm. terms of companies being able to roll up profits. That is one of the things that we will look at in the review that we're doing on corporate tax. Uh, and of course, what's happening internationally is because you know, various international bodies are now looking at whether there should be minimum rates for corporation tax, you know, what the rule should be for the big conglomerates that are based and do business around the world, may allow us to remote, remove 010 and still be competitive. But where I disagree with the question just been put is if you know become uncompetitive and firms leave then let them um because frankly you know we all will have to be we'll be coming back and asking for more tax from the individual <laughs> islanders if that actually happens you wanted to come in better well, i was just going to relate what you've just said actually to the to the chart that's on the screen so you can see there that we've got a slice of of the of the pie that comes from corporates uh, at 72 million but those corporates also provide all of the employment on the island that generates the majority of our um, revenues, which come from um, income tax and social security contributions. So if you, if you erode that grey that slice too much, you lose the, the blue. We all lose our jobs and, and also um, we lose that tax take. Okay. Well, can I just add in relation to that? To answer the question, I would be very surprised if the corporate tax analysis that we're doing doesn't give rise to more corporate tax being payable, but it's not going to be anywhere near £85 million, which is the figure that we need to fill the deficit. OK, we're, go we're going to move on. We're going to move on to something that we have uh, talked about on the tax review panel at various stages, which is capital taxes. And a question from Jane. Should the states consider capital gains tax on properties which are not people's main or primary residence? Um, Maybe one for Mark normally, but I've been working him hard, so I'm going to come to Peter on this one. Okay. I, 
Well, the answer is I don't think anything that's a capital tax is, in my view, would be so detrimental to Guernsey, so detrimental to our position where we are in the world, that it's a no-no. It would be so counterproductive, it would be purely doctrinaire rather than practical. Now, in relation to... Uh, Can you say why, though? Because uh, people would just say, people... Uh, you know, Guernsey has set itself, as has Jersey and the Isle of Man and various other places, set itself up as a proactive, innovative... Uh, place where you can uh, prosper, where you can uh, where you can live, without taking away uh, your capital gains or your inheritance or whatever it may be. Now, uh, if if we go down that route, then uh, uh, Bethan was saying not flippantly, but I think probably tongue in cheek that people would lose their jobs. There'd be very few people with jobs, very few people with jobs, because our finance sector would collapse in my view overnight. Okay. Anybody want to add to that? No. Then we'll we'll move on. Uh, a, a subject which we thought would come up, which is territorial tax, from John says. What about Charles Parkinson's suggestions, like territorial tax? Why do you want to steamroll ahead with GST? Well, my understanding is that. Deputy Parkinson's helpful paper that he's done is what one of the uh, considerations that's been looked at in the further research. But yeah. I don't, who wants to take it on this side? Well, absolutely, that you know, it's very helpful to have that paper because it explains clearly what the ideas are, rather than just saying here is here is an answer. So that will be reviewed as part of the uh, the review that's happening on corporate tax. Uh, in terms of steamrollering, um, we've said several times and still say it and say it over and over again. We have to turn every stone to make sure that when we do go back to the states, members are fully informed of all of the uh, of the opportunities and the pitfalls with suggesting uh, certain types of taxation. There's no question of uh, steamrollering ahead with GST. And again, this is not a pure GST package. I would not be in favour of a GST unless there were some form of remediation. And the Social Security um, revisions which go with it enable it to be progressive. Without that, it would be pro uh, progressive. We've also, as, as Peter said earlier, uh, announced today that we, we, there will be a delay in this coming back to the States because we need to do a thorough job on corporate tax. And, and and I know there are concerns. We've heard them widely in the in the meetings that we've had with members of the public across the island uh, about zero ten and its unfairness, and we need to address that as part of this process. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you highlighted social security because I I do get a bit frustrated that we we, we that this whole process over the last few months has been GST, GST, GST. I understand why, but actually there's a, a once in a generation opportunity to make our social security system much fairer, much more progressive, much uh, easier on those on, on lower incomes. And that hasn't really been talked about very much. So I, I think it's important that that happens. Now, I hope I get the pronunciation right for the next name. Uh, uh, Lineker wants to talk about civil servants. Um, oh, this has to be one for Bethan. Can civil, <laughs> serv <laughs> can civil servants all be put on a wage of £18,000 a year? Uh, I've got an idea this may be somebody that earns about that themselves asking the question. Uh, and see how that affects our island savings um, and how much of an exodus we have from the public service, I guess. But um, it's, it's, I don't think it's seriously suggesting that, although we're taking it face value. But I suppose the question is, have we become bloated? Are we paying our civil service too much, either in pounds for each person or, or overall the wage bill? Where does the wage bill come into this equation, Bethan? Well, so we, as a public service provider, we, we do spend about 50% of what we raise on, on employing public service employees. Um, I think what I would say is um, we are competing for, for, for staff, both um, with, so when we need to attract teachers and nurses, etc., we, we have to pay the, the going rates to attract people to come, and also we are competing for staff in, in the local environment. So, um, you know, it is it is a big number how much we pay our public servants. But um, when you compare what Guernsey pays on public services versus most other um, jurisdictions, um, actually Guernsey's quite small, believe it or not. Yeah, we, I mean, even compared, I think, with Jersey or the Isle of Man, oh, we yes. pay a, yeah. a, a much smaller percentage of our, our um, GDP on, on, on staff costs. But 
Anybody else want to no, add anything? I think it's been well, well, ju just hmm. speaking as a lawyer, you, you can't cut salaries <laughs> like that. People have contracts and they have to be honoured by the state. So if we were to cut everybody's salary to 18,000, the states would have an enormous bill in, in litigation and six months pay, paid to every single oh, person okay. for for uh, for uh, termination of their contracts. So it's, n it's not uh, considerable. Okay, I've got a couple of comments, but I'm going to run it in with the next question because they're related, really. And that's from Carl, um, that says basically, well, try slimming down on your staff, explanation mark. Um, well, the question is, Carl, I guess, is which staff you want to slim down on. Most of the expansion that's going on recently, and people are saying you're employing more and more public servants, is in areas like healthcare and social care. Yep. Um, I mean, one of my biggest responsibilities is looking after probably the biggest spending part of our whole uh, establishment is on pensions. Well, I can tell you there are two people looking after the state's pension scheme, and uh, they actually do other things as well. I, I, I'm sure you can find somebody sitting in a room somewhere that you can point out and say, why do the states employ them? But my basic experience is actually what you hear in the saloon bars about it being massively overstaffed just isn't true. We've had trying to get things done sometimes, uh, not because people are lazy, just because there aren't the staff to get them done. But, um, well, let me just add, to there that. Are five, I looked at the figures today, coincidentally, there are 5,699 full-time equivalent positions. They're not all filled. There are always vacancies, et cetera, et cetera. That, for civil servants, that includes everybody from police officers to nurses to teachers. Uh, to administrative staff, every that, that's what we include, that's what we say civil servants, we really mean public servants, uh, but I don't think people distinguish between that and neither do I. Uh, of course there's bound to be a little fat in the system, there is in any system, but equally we could fill another hundred jobs in the civil service uh, that, we, uh, that people badly need, nearly every politician says I need more resources for my uh, committee. Uh, they're not going to get them, but that's what they say that they need in relation to all of that. So. It is exceedingly difficult. And I invited in my statement, and I invite states members when we come back and debate this in November or December, if they think that we can reduce civil service numbers, public service numbers, come up with details. Not just cut 200, cut 400. You come up with precise details because you've got access to the officers, you've got access to the information. Come up with those details. Okay, I would make the point when we're not talking about tax. I mean, we're talking about tax, people say, Co the, the, the cost of your, your public uh, servants. When we're not talking about tax, we're talking about staff shortages. They say, well, why don't you pay your nurses the same as Jersey? Why don't you pay exactly. your teachers the same? Why are we losing people to Jersey? So it, it, it's, uh, it's sometimes an easy line to, to bring out. Lee wants to broaden that up slightly, not just talking about staff, but spending generally, and says, why can't you simply reduce expenditure and utilize the massive reserves and capital retained to ease the problem? I think that's exactly the plan, that that, that that will be a part of the, the 85 million would be a lot more if we were not doing that. Is that do you want to try and give yeah, us some yeah, figures on that? Yes, yeah. so um, we have got significant reserves, um, but many of those reserves are for a particular purpose. So we have a, um, a superannuation scheme, so a pension fund. Um, we also have a fund that is currently um, supporting the payment of old age pension. But we know that that pot is, is going to run out, um, and that's part of the structural deficit that we are that we are running. We've also got um, reserves that are being used to fund um, capital schemes at the moment, and the, the investment that this state wants to make in in our infrastructure. And the plan is exactly to use over this term the majority of those reserves. So um, the states have decided to hold back about 150 million, which is a tiny percentage of our of our overall turnover. Um, in reserves, but the rest of it is committed to fund um, infrastructure this term. So that's exactly what the states are doing, using up the reserves, but there's only so long you can you can live well, on savings. Just expand on that. Once we've, you, you take off the superannuation fund, you take off the old age pension fund, and Bethan's explained that, the money that we get, we've set aside for capital projects during this term, and the 150 million that she's referred to, we've got nothing else left. Nothing. Nothing else left. There aren't massive reserves. I don't know where people think this thing is coming. There aren't massive reserves. Of course, we own properties, etc. If we sold those, I don't think too many people are going to buy a hospital or buy a school. Uh, so we just do not have uh, massive reserves. That's a complete myth. Reserves are part of it. Just cut spending was the other, the other well, the part. Cut, the spending, and again, I've invited 
and I invite states members and anybody else to come up with details of how we cut. Of course, I'm sure there is some spending that we can cut, uh, but uh, it's not going to be, it's 85 million pounds. That's a massive figure for an economy like ours. That's what we need and it's costed. Mark uh, and the others that have been on the, the working group, they haven't just plucked that figure from the air. It's come out after detailed research and careful consideration. And factoring in some costs and spending through, yeah. uh, you know, public sector yeah. reforms. Mark, you were trying to come in. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the things that came out of the debate that we had last year, the Green Paper debate, was that um, we agreed that there would be a review on, on services and cuts. So one of the things that we've done, I've written to every committee and asked them to come back with proposals for what services they would cut if we had to reduce their budget by 5, 10 or 15 per cent. Um, and we, we've had that information back and we're trying to assimilate it into a way which is pre presentable to the public without, frankly, without scaring people. Um, because I, I, and there's been some criticism in the media of me using the example of the education budget, for example, but that's because I'm trying to explain the size of the job that we have if we want to cut costs by 85 million a year. That's the same as getting rid of the entire ESC department. It's a really serious ask. It's hundreds and getting on for nearly a thousand civil servants being fired in order to save that amount of money. It just simply is not achievable purely through cutting costs. It has to be a combination of different things and it has to be spread broadly in order to ensure that there's the least amount of impact on particular individual sections of society. Do you think the states of this assembly has made a bit of a rod percent back that so many people stood at election? I'm not singling out you, many, many, many people stood at election, perhaps thinking that there was more fat to strip out than, than there actually is and so and sort of gave that message across? I, I think I think that's probably a fair fair criticism. I, I di there, there are ways of saving money, but they're not pleasant. Uh, and I say, for example, I've given the example in the past of means testing the state pension or means yeah. testing benefits. I know, yeah. I mean, and, and there are strong objections to that, and I completely right. accept that, but I'm, I'm saying it for the purpose of, mm. of demonstrating that the alternatives are not easy there you know there, there is no just simply you know tell people they can go away and uh, it'll solve itself but, you know we'd be we'd be really seriously harming public services if we had to cut 85 million from the budget okay well we'll move on martin has uh, contacted us to ask about vanity projects one of peter's favorite subjects um <laughs> although of course what's a vanity project depends on on your viewpoint i guess stop all the vanity product uh, projects, i.e. new harbours at St Sampson's and surveys at St Peterport, we don't have the money. Uh, of course, there is no decision to do a new harbour in St Sampson's. It's, <coughs> it's one option that's been looked at. The survey, I probably ought to talk about this, is because it's more SDSB yeah, than yeah, anybody yeah. else. Yeah, that. You've uh, impose that uh, the, the survey in St Peterport follows the state's uh, decision, yeah. and it is looking at whether or not we can extend the marina facilities in St yeah. Peterport. And the idea is that it would make us money and, and wash its own face. It would be almost unique in the, in the British Isles and being a fully not, not tidal marina. It would be a marina for all states of tide. Uh, but the decision whether to go ahead with that will be, there'll be a business case and we'll decide whether or not that, that's something to do. But yeah. uh, generally on, on vanity projects, do you, do you think that uh, this PNR pursuing vanity projects? W we're not vain people, so why should we pronounce that? Uh, uh, we're, we're not going to get into that. Side but, no, but yeah. seriously, no, we're not. I, uh, I mean, you know, it is a serious question, uh, and you've asked about PNR, but I think the states generally, mm. I think, have set their face by and large against vanity projects. Now, I know there's a talk about the tunnel and all that kind of stuff. That's a matter for the development agency. They will look at that issue. They'll look at it with a clean, shape, uh, clean slate and they'll, 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 they'll evaluate it. There are no, I'm not aware of any particular vanity project that's been approved by the states in recent times. Are you? Um, it depends on what you view as, as, as vanity. I, I actually, I don't want to get into debate for the next couple of days. I think trying to maintain an anti-tank wall um, from, uh, from uh, 1943 uh, when it's trying to fall down might be seen as a... Right. But anyway, there we go. We'll, we'll talk but, about but the no question, doubt we'll have one of your speeches. But the message that we're, we're, we're receiving loud and clear is don't spend money when you don't have to. Yeah. Understand that, but yeah. sometimes the opportunities to make money, like the blue economy and yeah. uh, uh, and yachting, is, is something you need yeah. to look at as well. well I think it's a, a very fair question. I'm glad the, the questioner raised it. Okay. Uh, deficit. Martin wants to talk about deficit. He says, what percentage of the 85 million uh, is, saving, is savings from expenditure? Uh, Mark, I, my, my understanding is that the 85 million is the net, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but do you want to expand well, on that we've bit? Got, we've got slide six, which um, 
gets us to the 85 million. Um, and I think you need to explain this. Slide yeah, well, I, I, actually, I wonder if I might duck out this one and ask Beth to explain it. I think yeah. they're her numbers. <laughs> it's a little I bit can do. I'll just get it up in front of me so that I can see it properly. Um, so we've started off here from where we are today. So the, the budget for 2022 is an operating surplus of 13 million. So then we know we've already got um, um, a, a deficit on our social security scheme, so particularly the old age pension. And we also know that we don't have enough money from that 13 million to fund um, capital investment. So they, they take the, um, the problem from a, well, from a 13 million pound surplus into an 80 million pound deficit. If we then look forward into the future and think about the pressure on, on health services and how they're going to, the cost of health services as we're all living um, longer lives is going to increase, that takes our deficit to about 140 million pounds. And then we add on some other things like the loss of income tax from the introduction of secondary pensions, the introduction of nice drugs, etc. So that takes our grand total to 160 million pounds. Then we, um, we say that we're going to deliver some savings from public service reform, so that's the question that you've asked, and we're saying that's about £10 million, so we, and that's in, in addition to some savings which are already in our baseline, so that takes the deficit back down to £150 million. And then we've assumed um, a reasonable amount of economic growth. So in each year, we've, we're seeing some economic growth, um, and that adds up to um, about £70 million. So that takes our deficit net down to about £85 million. But I don't think anybody's pretending that £85 million is the exact figure that's yeah. going to come out. Yeah. It's our best estimate. It's not a guess. It's the best estimate, as has been explained, using fairly established methodology, but it could be 70 million, it could be 100 million, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's round about there. Anybody else want to yeah. add on this one? Then we'll move on. Middle earners, uh, the squeeze middle. Uh, Pat wants to ask about middle earners, saying that they appear to be taking a big hit. Uh, if GST is to be introduced across the board, how do you expect them to maintain a reasonable standard of living for their family? Uh, I'm going to ask, I think, Mark to tackle that, but I think maybe bring back slide four as well. I know we've had it up once already today, but I think it gives some, yeah. some context. Um, it's an excellent question, Pat. So we had a, a report, in fact, reports just come out in Jersey as well, comparing um, standard of living and various other uh, parameters which compare us on, a, on an equal footing with other jurisdictions in the OECD. Uh, and Guernsey, it would, I mean, it was a really pr impressive performance. I think we came out, you know, top of most of the uh, of the of the measures for quality of life and uh, amount of earnings and so on per average. The real thing that stood out to me most of all with that was we have amongst the highest cost of housing anywhere in in the OECD countries, and that really, really seriously impacts on on families' uh, ability to spend and their free spend, and so. Oh, to some extent, at the moment, all roads lead back to housing and housing supply uh, as something that we do need to fix in terms of the supply. And that's across all sectors, um, not, not just social housing, but, but across all affordable housing. In terms of the, the impact of GST, yes, it's correct that you know, um, middle earners will be paying uh, more, and I think this slide four helps to demonstrate where. But I think you know, the, the, uh, the amounts of it increase in expenditure till you get up to the 75% is only about 1%. So it's not, a, it's not as significant as it would be because if you, if you take the other example is what do we do instead of this, let's have income tax, then most of those people in the middle, in the middle sector there who, who may have young families and a large mortgage, a very large mortgage at the moment, um, and working, they'd be impacted much, much harder by an income tax and a rise in social security than 1% on their weekly shop. I mean, if, if people want to work out the impact for themselves, the easiest way to do it is take your, your salary and add 6% of income tax and social security on top of it, and then add 1% to your, to your shopping. And the, the comparison between the two is a very significant difference. And that's really why um, we've been working so hard to look at spreading the load across because we feel it does spread the load much better than simply imposing o on the working population and particularly middle earners. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I've said my bit on them. Yeah, I mean, you're 
Absolutely right. We're not here to talk about the, the housing crisis in inverted commas tonight, but there's no doubt that what's making Guernsey so difficult to live in for so many people is the cost of housing. And it's not just people buying housing, but actually rental have got been going up at a faster rate than, than, than uh, house purchase prices uh, have been. So if there's one thing that this state does need to do, which is not a uh, a vanity project it may involve quite a lot of spending of money over the next few years is really get the supply side up on on, on that but there we go Absolutely. it's great way? that this is an interactive evening because somebody's picked up on a comment that's made earlier and come go. come back on it and that's adam that's saying uh, higher earners why, why shouldn't the money come from higher owners i think adam's saying a 30 percent ban on earners over sixty thousand, which i think was mentioned earlier this yeah. evening sounds very reasonable to adam Quick and efficient, what is the downside? So, can cool. I take that one? Yeah. I, I think the point, uh, if the, the other part of what Bethan said there is that raises 40 million. It doesn't get you anywhere near 85. So, in order to, do, to, in order to raise the 85 simply on higher earners, they would have to be paying, getting on for 60% income tax, plus Social Security at over 12% now. The, nobody is going to be here, work, that earns over 60,000 is going to be in the island working here. It, it's just not doable. It's not. It's it, it, even the thirty percent that would raise. Uh, you know, uh, well, it should be forty percent. Forty million. Forty percent. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, that's it's right. Ten off. It'll be twenty yeah, off. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but even that uh, only gets us part of the way there, and you're getting very quickly. I mean, that would be forty-two percent effectively with if you were self-employed with your social security. You're paying the same tax as you do in London. In, in which event, why live here? But also, if you look at the, let's say it was 40 percent, not 70,000. Yeah. That's 28,000. That's without all your indirect taxes, all your other taxes. That would leave people earning 70,000, good salary, 42,000, and they've got all the other taxes to pay. And the mortgages. And how on earth are they going to manage? But I would have some sympathy with it if it, the question was, you're going for something that won't take more money from the higher earners. But it's lucky we've still got, I think, on the screen, slide four, which shows that under the package, because Social Security contribution rates will go up, but so there'll also be an allowance so that it's you know going to help the people who only earn a little bit above that allowance. Actually, what's being proposed is taking more money from the high earners. So yeah, it, is, uh, it, it is doing well, what I... Think I the answer to the question was we should take yet more money from the high earners. I think that's what the question was. It is a philosophical question but it's also a practical yeah. question about competitiveness and it is an option for the states they if they choose to do that that's right it's maybe it. a gamble i think it's a gamble yeah. it's yeah. less secure can, less of a broad tax base um but it, if if they think if they agree i think it was adam that was was the last question with that then that that's an option for them uh we're going to move on to alex and alderney uh, i wonder if it's the alex i know in alderney <laughs> no no the impact of gst in alderney on food and energy is already uh far higher oh the price i guess he means of food and energy is already far higher so adding gst would aggravate that uh would that be fair for alderney on these goods um who wants to take that there has been a bit of work done, I think, yes, on, yes. on on the cost of all. Don't you? Um, yes. So, you... Um, there's been a specific request to look at the um, the price differential in Alderney. Um, so we have done some analysis looking at the basket of goods in Alderney, if you like. And yes, um, food is is more expensive in Alderney, um, but other things are are considerably cheaper. So um, I think food and energy are the are the big ones that are more expensive. Um, some services um, are, are cheaper, um, accommodation is much cheaper, and um, so, for example, a pint is, is much cheaper in, in Alderney than it, is, than it is in Guernsey. So when you take it all together, yes, there is, a, there is a price differential between Guernsey and Alderney, but it's not as large as, as one might expect. Um, but the, the steering group is, is actively looking at that and making sure that that is taken into consideration before any final proposals are made. You spent time in Alderney. Have you got I any do. observation on that? Yeah, we, we went and we did the, the roadshow up there. You, you were there mm -hmm. as well, Peter, and, and spoke to a lot of people about it. I think the, the, the difference was 5%, wasn't it? So it, in terms yes. of cost of living on that basket, same basket of goods that we used to measure it in Guernsey. So I think there was, a, there was an example of the impact. Certainly, uh, you're, you're right, Alex, there, there would be a higher impact on, on uh, certainly on Alderney residents in terms of the, of the cost of living. Okay. 
Um, next one, I think, is more of a comment than a question, but I'll, I'll read it out and invite the panelists to comment on the comment. It, it comes from Rex, and the subject is poverty. Rex says, I have two jobs. The cost of fuel is obscene. The cost of living is going up. You're strangling this island. Any more raises on anything risk placing people on the red line. Peter? Yeah, well, I think I understand the sentiment, uh, and it is very difficult. Now, he talks about two jobs. I heard a lady the other day uh, talking, I overheard the conversation. She had three jobs. She was working 80 hours a week in her three jobs, and she was struggling to pay her rent. It, it's a wider debate about helping people who really need to be helped, a more philosophical debate, which goes wider than these points. Rex is right to raise it, though. Uh, but we've got to raise revenue, albeit I hope not for the, from the people who cannot afford to pay it. Mark, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I mean, one of the, just picking up again on one of the points that you just made, Peter, about um, social security contributions. You know, one of the one of the, the big advantages of uh, we've got opportunities we've got now is to restructure some of these um, uh, uh, contributions and some of the the traps at the at the lower end where people are earning just above the, the minimum amount uh, and then paying contributions on their full earnings um, are quite unfair. Um, but it's very expensive to sort out without a big reform of, of the tax, tax uh, uh, package. And I think, I think this does give us an opportunity to help some of those people who are doing lots of jobs, possibly low, lower paid jobs, but, but struggling. This does give us an opportunity to, uh, to do something for those people. Actually, that, that trap in the social security system has two bad effects. It means if somebody does earn a little bit more, they suddenly have to pay money on everything they earn. But I think there's quite a lot of people out there, it's anecdotal, I haven't got the full evidence, that actually choose to stay just below that. So when we've got a shortage of, uh, of, of labour and, uh, and staff in the island, actually having a system that deters people working more hours or, or seeking promotion is probably not a very good idea. So, okay. Here's a perennial question from Gary. Uh, a cash in hand. If you want to raise more revenue, then tighten up on cash payments to tradesmen. GST will encourage more ways to do cash payments and reduce revenue. Um, we haven't got anybody from Revenue Services here tonight, but uh, uh, you know, I guess it's a treasury issue, how to, how to make sure that people pay the tax they should be. Do one of you want to, to take that? Yeah. Well, I think we, you know, we, the revenue service is obviously very, very keen to to understand where where this is happening, and do have a, a, a team that looks at ensuring that people are paying the right amount of income tax. Um, yes, I, I think you know that there, there is always this kind of um, grey economy, um, and anywhere, but we we do our best to try and collect all the income tax that's due, and would do the same for GST. And I think, I don't know how big the problem is in, in terms of income tax that, that, that's not paid or, or, or um, social security contributions that are avoided. But I think with GST, actually, given that we're th talking about having a very high registration threshold, as they do in Jersey, of over, th th over 300,000, um, small traders who are trading at lower than that level wouldn't actually be registered for GST, so they wouldn't they wouldn't be avoiding GST because they wouldn't have to pay it anyway. So I, I, it's, I suspect it's probably not such a big problem the way we're thinking about introducing so it, as, 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 it, as, it as, as it might be in, in, in the UK, where they have a lower registration threshold. I think that's right. It won't be aggravated by GST. There may be an issue that people are not, you know, that people are doing cash in hand jobs. Oh, of course, it's not illegal to pay somebody in cash. They just meant to declare it rather than, yeah. OK. Um, Oh, it's not just us actually referring to our pack of slides. Our, our questioners are now starting to refer to the pack of slides. Uh, Diane wants to talk about the, the deficit, and she's flagged up slide six. Uh, have you, or maybe that's our producers that have done that, I'm not sure. Have you shared how the 85 million deficit is quantified? I guess it's our producers that have done that, actually. We are sort of re going over slightly over the same ground, so we'll put slide six up again. So if, if anybody missed it, just briefly um, explain how we get to the 85 million. Um, okay, so we, we start off with, we've got surplus at the moment, but only an operating surplus. So clearly we've got um, revenue income, revenue Do expenditure. Do you explain what that means, you've got an operating yes. surplus, not a, a surplus in the full sense of the yes. word? Yes, so what I'm thinking is that we're the, you know, the income tax and other taxes that we raise every year fund our public services, so um, teachers, nurses, police, etc. And following that, we've got a surplus of about 13 million. But 
out of that surplus, we should be funding um, capital investment. And we know that capital investment needs to be significantly greater than £13 million a year. So we've already got a... Uh, if we were spending what we needed to on that capex, we've already got a, a, a deficit. Um, we've also got a deficit on our social security funds. So we... Um, the, the pensions that we pay out at the moment cost us more than the, than the contributions that we are raising. Luckily, we can use the funds that have been accumulated in the past to fund those, but eventually those funds will run out. Um, so that so the deficit that we've already got is being masked at the moment by using reserves. Then we know that um, health service um, costs are rising um, because mainly because we're all living longer and, and need to consume um, health care. So we, we estimate that by 2040 that those costs will have gone up by about £140 million. Pounds. Sorry, sorry, by about £70 million, pounds, um, that, which will take our deficit up to about £140 million. Pounds. And then there are some other things that the states have approved, like um, changes to, um, to the allocation of nice drugs, um, locally and the introduction of secondary pensions which will mean that people pay um, less income tax um, until they start drawing their pension so that takes our deficit up to about 160 million pounds so then we have to take out of that the things the positives if you like so that we've got about 10 million pounds worth of savings that we've got planned in in the next few years of course future states may may then be able to save more but that 10 million takes the deficit down to um, 150 and then the assumption around um, economic growth. Now, we know economic growth could be more than this or less than this, mm. um, and some years, and it's, ne it's never in a straight line, but we've estimated that we'll get about 60 to 70 million pounds of benefit through economic growth, which will lead to higher tax take, and that's what takes us to 85 yeah. million. I'll just expand on one element of that, because I think some people get a bit confused about how the Social <laughs> Security Fund works. Um, we, we, I know my success, my predecessors have explained it time and time again. It is not, you do not pay contributions to be kept in a, a piggy bank for your own uh, pension later on. It is basically a pay-as-you-go scheme. So today's contributors are paying for today's pensions. There is a buffer fund, and it's for two or three years' worth of expenditure, but it is not a funded scheme as such. So uh, just, just to explain that yet again. Uh, Right, we're going to move on to a subject I thought might come up. Gordon has uh, opposed the question on environmental tax. And Gordon says, many places have introduced carbon consumption taxes. Have you considered these sort of taxes uh, to raise money and address the carbon problem at the same time? Uh, Mark. Yeah. Hi, Gordon. Thank you for your question. Um, we have looked uh, quite extensively at these types of tax um, we decided after looking at various things, paid parking and, and con congestion charging, all of the kind of uh, taxes that you're, you're suggesting there. The, the issue with this kind of tax is that if it's really successful, you don't raise any money because it's d intended to drive behaviour rather than to raise revenue. Uh, and the examples that we've looked at don't raise a significant amount and certainly nowhere near enough to get us near the, the, uh, the deficit that we're looking at. That's not to say that they aren't... That they aren't uh, uh, likely to happen at some point in the future but I, I suspect that members will more likely want to see them because they drive uh, an environmental benefit or some change in behavior that is beneficial to, to society generally unfortunately they don't get us anywhere near the total that we're looking at we could increase the taxes on i'm not saying we should i'm just uh, posing the question we could increase taxes on things like motoring i guess people yeah. won't just give up their car, I guess, just because you slightly increase the tax on... No, and I th that's yeah. one of the issues, is that fuel, fuel duty at the moment, fuel is very expensive. It may go up further, depending on how mm. the Ukraine uh, crisis um, pays out and the cost in, in terms of uh, shifting from, from gas into other sources. Um, there's an issue as well with the growing use of electric cars. They don't they don't contribute at all to that take, and you know that that means that we may have to look at a wider. There's a there's a um, a project going on in terms of charging by the mile driven. Um, I I prefer something much simpler, which is just a flat a flat rate um, of of duty because it just ra raises uh, money rather than uh, drives particular types of behaviour. But I know there are other um, states yeah. members who have different views on that. So, but we certainly are looking at them. They will be summarised, I suspect, in in the uh, appendices to the policy letter when it comes out, and that work is valuable in terms of informing that type of tax approach mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally. 
quite attracted to environmental taxes, but I'm not naive enough to think they're really going to do the heavy lifting in this respect. They are going to be sort of in the margins, hopefully change the behaviour for the better, hopefully raising a bit of money for the Exchequer, but, you know, it's, it's not going to be the, the big ticket item here, I don't think. Uh, this is a question that often comes up as well, and it's been interesting talking to Jersey about this next one, because Carl has, has not phoned in, he's, he's posted a question on, on Facebook about GST, and Carl says, if you bring in GST, what percentage of the money you bring in would be needed just to manage the system? What's the cost of administration, if you like? This is a fairly technical one, so I'm going to go down to, to the I, Treasurer. I can, I can try and answer that one. So... Um well, the first thing to say is, yes, there will be a cost of collection, both for the states, but also um, for the business that, businesses that need to administer GST. So if I deal with the state side first, we've done some work on this, and um, we would need additional staff in terms of collections, but also um, in customs to manage the sort of imports and so forth. We think it will cost about, about a maximum of about £800,000 a year to administer. Now, that's whether we're raising... Uh, 50 million or a 5% GST or, or a higher amount. It's the, the cost of collection is about the same. That could come down depending on on how um, on how um, import thresholds are are applied. So that's the cost to the states. Um, there's the cost to businesses, um, it's, it's quite difficult for us to get um, firm figures on this because most jurisdictions that introduced a GST did so before there were sort of um, snazzy. Um, apps and so forth to ma and, and sy computer systems to manage um, the the administration of GST and therefore um, it's been quite hard for us to get some firm numbers um, we think that it would the the setup cost will be around about one percent um, in the first year and it's and we're, we're still trying to do some work to understand what the cost the ongoing cost for businesses would be of administering okay. the GST. We had a presentation as well, if you remember, yeah. from Jersey yeah. by civil servants uh, not that long ago to states members. Uh, 2020 figures, so not that far out of date. Cost to the state, there is the additional cost to businesses, of course. Cost to the state was £800,000 per annum, and on a 5% GST, they were raising £94 million. So it's probably £100 million now, because that was a couple of years ago. So that's the kind of figure. I don't see that we should be any particular difference from that. And Bethan, I think, has made that point. Their head of revenue services actually said of all of their taxes, it was the cheapest to raise, by far to, to, raise. To, to raise money. But I, want, I, I will move on, but I just want to... Talking about that presentation, yeah. there was an interesting, uh, and maybe bring Mark in on this, yeah. the business about the treatment of online, online purchases, because I think everybody's assuming that a GST would create an on-level playing field and that, you know, people will... Yeah. Do you want to explain the situation there or what Jersey's situation Yeah, so, so, so what Jersey have, uh, have done is they have, they have passed a law which will come into effect next January where um, anybody... Um, if, you, if, you buy, if you shop online uh, and have an import goods into, into Jersey, you have to pay uh, GST at the time, at the point of purchase. So if you go online to an online uh, retailer, you have to pay your 5% 5, 5 GST at the time you purchase it. And every, every retailer who is shipping goods to Guernsey, uh, to Jersey, um, who ships goods worth more than the threshold of 300,000 will have to register and, and comply with that. And, and they're able to do that because there have been some changes in the, in the EU uh, legislation around, around their VAT schemes, which, which mean that, that, that um, uh, retailers have to charge the right GST or the right VAT for the country or the consumer. And that's something that's come in over the last couple of years. Um, and so Jersey can now piggyback off that. So and there's no reason why... Instance, don't think twice when Jersey say, collect the money for us, because they're having to do it for every other country. That uh, from yeah. what we understood from Jersey, Amazon in particular have been, have been very, very happy to, uh, to engage in, in, in the, uh, implementing the new law. And they're now working through the other largest um, retailers who, who supply to Jersey. And uh, we would assume we could do the same. Well, so we haven't done the work on that yet, but we would expect to be able to do the same. Okay. It's approaching 8 o'clock, and our original intention was to do about an hour, but we're, we've been delighted with the sort of number of questions Indeed. that have been coming mm -hmm. in. So uh, we do have quite a few still stacked up, so if colleagues are willing, we'll keep going for another 10 or 15 yep. minutes to get through, 
a few more questions, if that's okay. So Douglas is next. Douglas wants to talk about inheritance tax, and his is, a, I suppose, a technical question, but at what percentage would an inheritance tax start to raise uh, a meaningful sum? Um, I don't know. Uh, the it depends what you mean by meaningful. It's a bit subjective. Well, but don't forget, we had a presentation this uh, recently, mm -hmm. whereby if we raise it at the same levels that they raise in England, yeah. it would bring in one to two million pounds a year. That's all. Yeah. So we'd have to significantly, if we were going to get it to 10 million or whatever, it would have to be significantly more than the UK rate. Uh, and I can't think that's likely to be attractive. Well, the, other, the other point, Peter, is it's really expensive to collect it because it's a very, very complicated area. You need very highly qualified accountants in order to review estates matters and and you know things like encumbrances and and uh, competing claims on estates it's not not a cheap thing most capital taxes are very expensive to collect because they need a lot of people uh, to do it whereas you know gst as we've said the the other thing i, th I think from the previous question that one of the things that i was amazed at from the jersey presentation from their tax controller was how easy the form is to fill in it's one side of a4 it's a single line it's, it's not a very very complicated process to complete and i think uh, i found that actually quite reassuring along with the fact that if you if you know if you've got a business that generates less than three hundred thousand of turnover you're not you're not filling the forms in at all Okay, I can choose to, but they, they're not yes. obliged to register. Yeah. So I, I, I think the answer then probably is on, on inheritance tax, that if one or two million in the context of 85 shortfall is nowhere near being significant, it would have to be several times uh, the rate of the UK, and I think that might be quite difficult to, uh, to sell. Uh, Robert wants to know about the time frame for the implementation of any new tax, and is it likely to come in after the next election? Um, well, uh, we've heard today... Um, from uh, PNR, I'm not sitting on PNR, but I am not surprised to hear the news that there's some slippage already in when you're going to go back to the States. So, uh, Peter, what, what, what's your, your well, I prediction? I think Mark on answers that in part. GST would come in up by the time, in the practical terms, it would be after the next election. Uh, and I think some of the other taxes, it depends what, what we do. I mean, corporate tax would come in before. Uh, it, it really does depend on, on what the States would decide in November and December. So the answer is some could be before the next election, but some are most certainly would be after it. But it, I mean, right, it's a very political question, but I'm going, uh, it, does the decision not need to be taken? I mean, this House would have taken years deliberating on this, having all of these yep. sort of events. We can't really, can we leave it to the next Assembly no, to make the decision in the early months or whatever? No, no. I think that's probably right. We, and also, you don't want to make it a key issue, the, the only issue in an election, because there are lots of other things that we need to be doing as well. Um, I, I think one of the things I'd stress with this is that it's it's not a it's, it, you, you need to put the implementation process in, and that's probably a two year period before you could actually you know tick the press the button and, and off we go. If we don't have that um, GST provision or some other form of, of mixture, we cannot do the social security amendment. So the two that these two things are are they're, you know, symbiotic. They, yeah. they they require each other in order to make it work. I think what I'll ask to go in the policy letter is what we would have to do to reform Social Security without the tax side, because I think it would mean the contributions would have to go so high that yeah. we would just be seen as a very uncompetitive uh, jurisdiction in that respect. Okay, we're going to get another two or three and then we'll, we'll wrap up for the night. Uh, Liam um, wants to talk about Orany, uh, or wants to ask about Orany, and says, how much does Orany make the island to justify its losses? Um, well, I guess I probably ought to have a go at this yeah, because uh, yes, share, yes, we're right. the shareholder rep. I don't run Orany, but I'm the yeah, shareholder yeah, yeah, representative. Yeah. Um, obviously, the last couple of years, Orany's losses have been eye-watering, have, as have been the ports, because people haven't been travelling because of COVID. Uh, I personally think that the loss level that was going on before that, when in 2019, when it was an ordinary trading, is difficult to justify. I think that perhaps they, they're needed to be a tightening up for some things. I actually believe the current administration at Orany, when they say that all things being equal, and we know that fuel may be going through the roof at the moment, but all things being equal, they believe they can break even or make a, a, a very small profit. It is an important enabler. Uh, having proper connectivity with the rest of the world is really important. And even if we encouraged a... a, a, a you know, a, a, a low-cost airline to come here, we wouldn't be able to guarantee that they would stay there. They would probably reduce their flights in the winter. They would probably say, is Guernsey the most important yep. place to use our plane at this moment? So it does give a, a certainty. 
We have to remember our market is an awful lot smaller than Jersey's. They can afford, I think, to be a little bit more covered there because the bigger the number of people you have and the bigger your tourist trade, the more that you know you, the people are going to want to serve you. So I could stand up, and it's not the evening to do it, and justify already. I can't justify the losses of the last couple of years. That's just been something that's happened to airlines all around the world. But I think watch this space. I think we need to hold their feet to the fire over the next few years, and we expect those losses to come down to, to next to nothing. And um, if it's not, then we, I think we have to do a retake on the whole thing. Well, let me just add to it, because I was your predecessor. You at, were. Uh, and yeah. you're e exactly right about losses. I think we've got a really good management team in now. The proof of the pudding will be the eating. I think that's true. But compare it. Uh, Low-cost airlines have got no loyalty to the jurisdictions they serve. They're there quite properly to make a profit, and they'll move at the blink of an eye. And if you look at the history of aviation, very, very few airlines have ever made money over any period of time. Most have gone bust, including some very big names. We're very lucky to have all, and it should be run as efficiently as we can. I'll give you an example. When I went to uh, be able to go and lay the wreath at the Cenotaph in November, my colleague from the Isle of Man came down. He had to travel down at 8 o'clock at night, because that was the only flight they had to London, uh, by, I think it was EasyJet. Now, that was the... OK, they got connection to the north of England, because they're, they're, they're based up in that part of the world. We are fortunate to have Orney. Uh, Orney. Uh, it's cost us, I think, over the years, about £100 million. Pounds. A lot of that's been the last two years. A lot so of that's in the last two years. Generally, generally, and of course there have been undoubtedly some wasted money, it's been a good investment. Mark, yeah, I, did, I, mean, I, was, I was doing some research um, during the COVID period, actually, and it came across some um, figures about s support which is provided for the Scottish Highlands. Mm. And there's about 16 million of support that goes towards their air, air framework up there. So we're not unique in um, providing effectively a subsidy. And, and I also did some, some calculations comparing it to the subsidy we provide for the buses. And actually, per bum on seat, it's, it's very similar. It's about okay. £3.50 per... A ticket, and obviously there are a lot more, you know, um, a lot more movements. But um, you know, we we do provide subsidies for for transport, and and our air links is one of them. We have worked quite hard at re redefining the the shareholder objectives for the company, um, working in conjunction with them. And uh, I, I just reiterate what what Peter said. I have, I have every confidence in the new management and the new chairman, and they're working very hard to to make sure that they try to meet that, the objectives we've set for them. Okay, and finally, I would say don't assume that Jersey don't have a subsidy because yeah. I don't know the details. Yeah. All I know that low-cost airlines don't tend to like to pay the full uh, cost of the airport fees that, that uh, to the places they operate to. And one final thought, if already goes, you don't need to replace, you don't just need one low-cost airline because it won't be low-cost, you need two. Look what happened in Jersey when um, British Airways went on strike. Suddenly, went suddenly the prices of uh, EasyJet flights were not cheap at all. But there we go. Let, let's park or I could talk all night. Let, let's move on to Gareth. Um, he wants to talk there about the OECD. And he, uh, Gareth asks, what are the implications of the OECD's move to implement both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2? So we're back to the corporate tax. Really. Yeah, I could, I could deal with that one. Um, so th these guidelines, dealing with them very simply, if we bring Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 together, the, the idea of these proposals is that global corporations, um, which have seats of business in lots of different jurisdictions, should contribute to the tax in every jurisdiction. And so what it's attempting to do is set a, a minimum tax rate, corporate tax rate of 15% for those particular companies in those um, particular jurisdictions. Now, um, the, the threshold for the turnover over of those companies is very high. So we only have a handful of them here in, I can't remember the number now, but it, the, the calculation that's included in these proposals for 10 million of corporate tax arises from those OECD proposals. Um, the, the implication of that is for the future is that the world is moving, and I think at a slow pace, because most jurisdictions don't want to create um, arbitrage in terms of competition between tax, but we are moving slowly but steadily towards some kind of global agreement on minimum corporate taxation I'm sure when that happens I don't know but it will be considered as part of the corporate review that we're doing and one of the options may be to look at some form of territorial hybrid um, situation which puts us in a compliant position from an international perspective but in, uh, enables us to collect more uh, more tax at the same time okay I'm gonna take two more questions over yeah of course Mark yeah um, I'm not privy to the terms of reference for the review that's being done of corporate tax at the moment. Um, no doubt, once that's been agreed, we will get to see that. Um, I, um, you know, 
I think the 10 million that we got at the moment as an estimate of, of additional corporate tax revenue is probably quite realistic. You know, we might be able to squeeze a bit more. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't hold my breath over that. But what I, what I would be very concerned about is if, if the whole package that we're looking at now gets delayed because we think, oh, in a couple of years' time, the OECD might make us help us to raise a bit more corporate tax. Because these things take a while. And then we put the new system in of corporate tax, and it takes a few more years before we know whether it's actually how much it's really raising. You know, and suddenly five years have gone by, and if it's not raising more than 10 million, we've, we've gone nowhere, and we've lost another five years, and we've, we're in an even more urgent situation. You know, I think we, we have to keep moving. Mm. You know, of course, we should do the review we're doing now, but we can't, we can't wait forever for corporate tax. That's a good point, Martin. And one of the things I would raise about that as well is there's some political uncertainty that the US will even pass the OECD proposals, and I think if they don't, they fall apart. But I, I don't think they'll happen. I'm going to take two more questions briefly because then we, we are getting, we're going way over normal time. Um, Sophie wants to talk about middle earners. What about other cuts to middle earners like secondary pensions, cuts to mortgage tax relief, and no doubt family allowance will be hit soon too? Well, I think I'd better take the secondary pensions bit. Of course, it is not compulsory on uh, individuals to uh, pay the secondary pension if they really feel they can't. I'd really advise people to do so because it's a, a tax efficient way to save to make your old age a bit more comfortable and of course your employer contributes towards it as well. But it, it will it be compulsory for employers to, to enrol people but if you really can't you can opt out. Um, family allowance at the moment the only, um, we've reduced it in the sense that only people earning less than £120,000 a year get it. But of course that money hasn't been just put back in the in the pot. It's been, if you take your child to, now to a doctor, they only pay 20, only pay £25,000 25, um, for the appointment and there's, uh, you know, some other benefits as well. Mortgage tax relief, I guess, is more one for, for P&R. Yeah, I mean, but just generally, I think Sophie's point we could pick up the individual points. Her point is right. And I said in the States, uh, and I said it out of frustration, really, uh, you know, we do a lot for better people on benefits, quite rightly too. We don't do enough, and I really would like us to have a philosophical debate at some time, and a practical debate. We don't do enough for the ordinary middle-range people who are suffering all these things. Pension, secondary pensions is a good thing. I fully support it. But we just don't do enough for them. Uh, there's no easy answer. But we should, there must be some answer to at least attenuate their difficulties. It's, it's a perennial problem that every, I think, society has had. And the only ones that really do it are the really high tax ones like Norway and yeah, yeah. You know, Scandinavia and whatever. Yeah. OK, we're going to finish off with the final question. Um, Tim, it's a very simple question. Do you intend to place GST on everything? Mark, <laughs> is anything sacred? Will anything be exempt? Well, I, uh, Bethan could probably answer the, 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 the technical parts of it, but I'd go back again, and actually this goes back to Sophie's point before that. If you compare what you would pay if your income tax went up in comparison to what you would pay as 1% as a middle earner on your shopping, there's a big difference between the two, which is why we're suggesting something that's much broader. And GST is the same thing. That The idea of this GST is... Uh, is looking at a model which is very similar to Jersey and to New Zealand where you have a, the, the widest and broadest possible scope of GST because it brings the rate right down. Whereas in the UK, VAT is at 20%. It's a very complicated tax to collect because it doesn't apply to everything. So, and there's the sort of age-old stories about, you know, is this a hot pie or is it the cold pie? Because they get different well, rates of cake and yeah, cake or biscuit. exactly. Yeah, yeah. All, all of those things, and that makes it much more complicated and more expensive to administer for businesses, and also for for the civil service to collect it. So, keeping it simple. Uh, means a broadest uh, possible approach. But there will be some things... But just to clarify, earlier you were saying one of the biggest costs hitting people in Guernsey at the moment is housing. Yeah. My understanding, just to make absolutely clear, is that your, your rent and your mortgage payments will, will not be subject to GST, is that right? No, and, and I, you know, I think it would make a very big difference if it were to apply that way. Yeah. I think it would be extremely difficult to apply. Anybody want to add anything? I would just say that, um, as Deputy Hellier said, it's the intention is to keep it as simple as possible and therefore apply it at a low rate on everything. Um, having said that, the um, the steering group is is going to be looking at some analysis over the next few weeks, which looks at the options for, for some limited 
um, exemption. So that that work hasn't hasn't yet been finalised. Um, it is being looked at, but the, the the really important one is is to keep housing costs out of the yeah. equation. Yeah, I mean, I need to emphasise this is still a work in progress. Of course, we put up a straw man. This is one of the blends of taxes we could do and and, and mitigations, but the final package is yet to to be nailed down. Okay, well, we're a quarter of an hour over our scheduled uh, finish time. I think speak from my panelists. We've been delighted with the flow of questions. We Indeed, yeah. really weren't sure how this was going to go, and people have really engaged with it, and I suspect it's a format we won't use every day of the week because it has to be a big issue, I think, to, to do it. But I'd like to thank my fellow panellists, but in particular I'd like to thank everybody that's been watching and, and everybody that's put into the excellent questions. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up here now. Thank you all very much, and um, uh, goodbye. Thank you.